When most people think about the US military, they just think about its firepower. But what they don't realize is that the US military and the defense sector is actually one of America's most profitable businesses. And that's why they call it the military industrial complex. And this really shouldn't be surprising to anyone. I mean, we see it in movies all the time. How do you think Tony Stark got to be a billionaire in the first place? For your consideration, the Jericho. But Stark Industries is just a fictionalized version of one defense contractor. But what we're talking about are hundreds of real defense contractors, all backed by the biggest developer, maker, supplier, creator of military equipment in the whole world. Ladies and gentlemen, the United States of America. So in this episode, we're gonna focus on how the business side of the US military is actually one of America's chief competitive advantages. Let's go. Hi, this is Joseph Zhang, and I'm the managing partner here at Zhang & Associates, where we solve legal problems with creative solutions. Let's get to today's episode. Every business plan starts with the size of its market cap. So how big is the market cap for military defense? In 2018, the 100 biggest publicly traded defense firms brought in a combined total value of $420 billion. But almost two thirds of that came from US defense firms, which are all publicly traded. Now that's a performance up there with some of the best S&P 500 companies. No other country has this kind of dominance over one single market. Italy, France, and Spain can barely capture 50% of the world's wine sales. Now it might surprise most Americans, but this isn't normal. Most countries don't have this many multi-billion dollar defense firms. And that makes sense, right? Most countries, might just have the military design their defense equipment for their own internal use. They're not gonna trust it to civilians, but not us. What we have is essentially 50 Stark Industries all competing against each other to see who can come up with the next military breakthrough. And these defense contractors dominate close to 60% of the global defense market. So how did we come to have 50 Stark Industries in the first place? Well. Prior to the first two world wars in 1914 and 1945, the US wasn't particularly focused on becoming an international military superpower. If anything, we were too busy shooting each other with muskets. But in the early 20th century, America was forced to double down on its military infrastructure in order to combat the rise of fascism overseas. And that was the catalyst which set everything in motion. Then, just as World War II ended, when everybody else was focusing on rebuilding their war-torn countries, we were immediately thrust into the Cold War against the Soviet Union, which lasted right up until 1991. And again, the US had to double down on its military infrastructure. By the time this was over, America had essentially emerged as the world's chief military superpower, having already established more foreign military bases than every other country put together. This is the context behind why today, the United United States spends $700 billion on its annual defense budget. Meanwhile, all of the spending has incentivized hundreds of defense firms to pop up all around the country. So how powerful is this monopolization of the arms trade? Well, here's one crazy example. Recently, the US managed to sell 66 F-16s to Taiwan for $8 billion. Do you know when the F-16s were created? They were created in the 1970s. Do you know what else was created in the 1970s? Floppy disks. Okay, I know it's not fair to compare the F-16s to floppy disks. They are good planes and they are still in use today, even in the US. But the point is that American defense firms have such a monopoly over the arms trade that they're able to still profit off of the inventions that they made 50 years ago. All right, so let's say you are a different country and you want to get in on some of the action. You want your own defense firms to create cutting edge technology and supplying that to the rest of the world for a profit. What are you gonna do? Are you going to suddenly divert a huge part of your GDP to the military spending and let everything else suffer? Are you gonna stop building roads and build aircraft carriers? People are gonna ask who you're trying to invade. You see, the US had 100 years to slowly build up their might, and they had a historic reason and justification to do so. And they were able to do it and still gain a profit the entire time. And they were able to take that profit and reinvest it for the next iteration of their military technology. And so any country or any defense firm that wants to get in on a piece of that action will have to first incur a huge loss without any foreseeable return on investment. And so the barrier of entry is just too high for defense firms and other countries to try to break into this space. It makes much more dollar sense to continue to buy from the US. But that is how the US got the monopoly. But you might ask, isn't this like a dying industry or at best a stagnant industry and it's not gonna continue to grow? How many guns and ships do countries really even need? More guns, I 
balance shifts, and so their balance shifts. Well, just like a well-run business, it is continuing to create new frontiers. What frontiers? Well, the US has recently launched Space Force. And yes, the name sounds extremely silly, but now the US has more things to research and to sell. It's no longer submarines, tanks, and airplanes, but also things in space. And with Google and SpaceX launching Starlink, this is going to be a critical infrastructure for the US military to guard and to protect, providing internet, fast internet, all over the world. And that's not all. Just like how Apple is going into services, the US military defense is going into intelligence. With the expected IPO of Palantir, Peter Thiel's multi-billion dollar company that provides data analytics to the Department of Defense. Now, when this intelligence is being provided to the private sector, believe me, it's going to change the game of security. The purpose of Palantir is to bring the Palo Alto culture in the form of a platform to an enterprise to revolutionize the work being done in that enterprise on the back of this platform. For the foreseeable future, the United States of America and its defense contractors are going to remain the dominant player in the global arms trade with very little competition. America! Ellen! This is not a good thing. It's not a good look for Uncle Sam when we are the chief benefactors of war and fear. There's already endless conspiracy theories and books about how the US is the puppet master behind every international conflict and war. Also, when one country has this much power, all it takes is a few mistakes for it to accidentally or intentionally end the world or at least lead to World War III. John Oliver did a great episode on how this almost happened and how we safeguard our nuclear arms. There are two key things stopping us from reducing our nuclear weapons. And there's no easy way to fix this. How do we, at the same time, be number one in military defense, continue to push for new technologies and advancements, all while not exactly benefiting from people's wars and conflict and looking like the bad guy? Well, that is your call. And remember what Uncle Ben said. With great power comes great responsibility. And you have the responsibility this November 3rd to pick the next commander in chief of the United States of America. And that's not a responsibility you should take lightly. Thank you for watching today's video. This is the third episode in our series, Let's Talk America. If you like what you see, please smash that like button and subscribe. We're releasing two new videos every week leading up to the election. Until then, see you later. Bye-bye.